Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, July 10th, and this is the weekly market update. Before we get started, um, let me give you the disclaimer. This podcast or video, however you're choosing to consume this data, is not investment advice. I am not a financial planner. I am not a uh, tax or financial expert. Please do your due, do, own due diligence. It's your money. It's your problem. It's your responsibility. So before I get started, let me just uh, say a couple things. Um, I want to make sure that folks understand that um, we really, I really do appreciate the feedback that I get from a lot of people that listen to this channel. We've really had quite a bit of growth over the last year, and I get quite a bit, quite a few emails, messages, where people have told me that they appreciate the work that I do, or I have helped them to open their eyes to something in financial markets or just in general knowledge that they had not considered before, and uh, or I've you know had them reconsider something that you know was not in their best interest. And to me, that, that really, really hits home. It really makes me understand some of the responsibility I have. You know, um, a lot of people, we're not taught these things in school. A lot of people's parents don't even know these things. So where do you get, where are you going to get knowledge from? Where are you going to get schooling on financial matters? And I'm not saying I'm an expert, but I have a lot of wisdom because I have been through decades of this stuff. And as I said before, um, experience is the best teacher. And if you can learn from somebody else's experience, you won't make the same mistakes, you won't waste time and money and effort. And so I just wanted to say thank you to the listeners and the supporters of the channel. Uh, we really appreciate, uh, I, I really appreciate, you know, how this has went. You know, I started this thing off, I didn't know how it was going to go. It was kind of a vanity project but it's really kind of opened my eyes and to there's a large group of people out there that, you know, think that are free thinking that are thirsty for knowledge that want to take responsibility for themselves, not only financially, but just personally, every facet of their life. And so it's encouraging that we're able to um, come together and uh, realize that we're not the only peer person thinking some of these things sometimes. Uh, am I always right on everything? No, I am not. Uh, one of the things I do appreciate is you guys do put me in check. If there's some information that I'm wrong on or I've misspoke about, uh, you got to remember something. I don't have like a lot of notes. I put this thing together. I get into like a mood. I put this thing together in like an hour and a half every week. And then I get on here. I just speak extemporously. I just, whatever comes to my mind and I use the slides as a guide, that's what I riff on. And sometimes, you know, I don't have necessarily the facts exactly the right way. It's not meant to deceive you or try to sway you. It's uh, just the nature of the beast. So I do appreciate when you guys step up and say, hey, wait a minute, uh, I think you're wrong on this. You might take a look at this. And then I do, if I take a look at it and I'm wrong, then I freely admit I'm wrong. Nobody's right all the time. It's impossible. So it's just another, like I said, benefit of this group of people that uh, I feel privileged to serve every week. Um, the one thing I would ask of you is if you get value from this, if you enjoy the content, if you enjoy listening to this, you know, if you're, I think it's, this goes out to like seven or eight different podcast platforms. I don't know what you guys listen to it on. I don't even know all the platforms. I just send it through an aggregator and it sends them out. But if you have the ability to rank the show, rate the show, comment on it, you know, take the time to do that. It really does help us out. And it helps spread the message. You know, I have, you see it in the comments, people feel so strongly or they feel, you know, the content's pretty good. And it's like, I can't, I can't believe this, this guy doesn't have hundreds of thousands of subscribers. Well, I, I think that's generous and I appreciate you saying that, but uh, it would be, you know, give us a hand. You know, if you like what you're hearing, if you like what you're seeing, you know, hit the like button, make comments, um, pass it around, whatever uh, that does, that does help us out. So um, I'm grateful for the growth we do have at steady, you know, slow and steady wins the race. And that's what we've been. 
Um, I've been around for a long time now and uh, on YouTube going on almost three years, I think. And, uh, you know, I feel like eventually we're going to break through and especially in this time of deceit, lies, you know, people don't, the truth does come out eventually and people don't, if they make certain decisions, you know, a lot of people, how am I trying to say this? A lot of people don't want it, the truth. They want to be led. They don't want to think for themselves. It's just an unfortunate that a lot of people are like that because it's scary for them. And so eventually the truth outs and I'm going to keep saying and doing what I'm doing on whatever platform I can, because I feel like, you know, the mainstream media is collapsing. The trust in the me mainstream media is collapsing in, in government, and all our institutions, and people are just sick of it. So they're looking for alternatives. And so I want to provide that alternative where I can. And I don't want to be the same can talking head. Um, you know, I want to, I want to make my comment value comments valuable and, and helpful to you guys. So help us out if you can. Uh, the other thing I want to say is, you know, feel free to subscribe to the newsletter, uh, actionable intelligence alert newsletter. And there's another option too. If you just want to try and see what we're doing, uh, what kind of work we're doing or what kind of companies we're actually, you know, speculating in or investing in, uh, there's an option, a Patreon option in the show notes. You can, you know, for five dollars, uh, you can sign up, and you will get the most recent um, stock pick that we have. It may not be this month. It might not be this month. We don't have a stock pick every month, but the most recent one, you would get that. It's a one-time deal. You only get it once, but it gives you a sense of the flavor of what we're doing and what kind of companies we're talking about and the type of uh, commentary that we do. You know, the average issue that I put out is about anywhere from 3,000 to 4,000 words, 10 pages, uh, company updates of this portfolio, new ideas and commentary. So uh, some people find it valuable. Some people have been with me since the start of it. Um, and some people, you know, don't like it. Uh, a lot of people don't, you know, some people, most people, uh, most people resubscribe, but you know, it's not for everyone because we're telling the truth and I'm not going to give you, you know, the boilerplate. I'm not going to hype things up. I don't hype it like a lot of newsletter people do. Uh, I, I think it's sleazy, this industry, uh, you know, these, the advertising that they do and how they couch their copywriting. I don't do that. I just tell you how it is. You take it or leave it. I mean, that's just be straight up. I believe being straight up with people trying to provide value. And if they get value, they'll pay for it. So, uh, that's just a short spiel I wanted to make before we get into this week's, um, commentary, but like I said, guys, I really do appreciate you. And, uh, you know, it's, I, I really feel fortunate and, and I enjoy, this is something that I enjoy doing once a week. Uh, it's something that gives me uh, pleasure and I, I find value in it because I'm, I, I, the feedback I get is tremendous. So thanks again. All right. So this is going to be like a Twitter Lollapalooza. I mean, I had a lot of, um, this is a reality check. And so it's going to kind of riff a little bit here. So uh, it's one of the people I follow on Twitter, I really encourage you guys to curate a, you know, to follow people, create a t Twitter channel and curate a group of people, analysts, people that around that you follow that are smarter than you, that have good information or expertise in areas that you don't. Um, what I found when I follow people on Twitter is you will run into people that are, you know, running hedge funds, private equity funds, are wealthy in their own right, are top-notch investors. And you'll find that, you know, you, you can interact with these people. You can ask questions. I've asked questions of people and got a response in five minutes and got a couple paragraph answers. The sharing that goes on, the willingness to, to you know, discuss things is really great. These are passionate people that care about what they're doing. And they like talking about, most people do at least, talking about something that they're passionate about. So if you're not doing that, I mean, Twitter... Yelling at, you know, the other side politically, I know that's a big part of it, but if you stay away from that and just stick to some of this stuff, uh, you'll find that uh, you can get tremendous, you can harvest tremendous value. So anyways, um, evidently the European Commission, you know, the uh, Soviet-esque uh, Central Committee of the European Commission, you know, because climate change is so something we must deal with immediately, uh, as long as we keep moving the goalposts every five or 10 years and say another five or 10 years, we're all going to fry. But anyways, that's, you know, that's another subject. 
but they, they want to lower CO2 pollution. That's what it's all about, right? Because we're in a crisis. So the tweet here, lots of laughs, taxes are for the masses, not for me. So the European Commission has proposed exempting private jets and cargo flights from the planned EU jet fuel tax. A, drafting in, a draft indicates that the tax would be phased in for passenger flights, including ones that carry cargo. So here we go again, right? You know, the masters of the universe, and I'm talking about the 1% of the 1%, I'm talking about the people that make all these policies that tell these little petty bureaucrats you know, the various countries that are controlled, European Union, the United States, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, basically the Anglosphere, um, you know, what to do. Gates, Soros, um, Bezos, all these clowns uh, that happen to be in the right place at the right time and are, you know, multi, multi billionaires. And so, you know, a lot of them seem to be convinced that the, you know, the world's going to end because there's too many uh, untermenschen which is all of us. There's too many undermen. You know, they are, you know, I think that a lot of these people are obviously secularists. They are humanists, but they don't like human beings. They only like themselves and other people like them. And I think what happens is, is if you're in the right place at the right time, or you do build a business that ends up becoming worth a hundred billion dollars or whatever, that you think that that's because of you. And to a certain extent, you know, maybe it was, but at some point, other people came into these businesses and helped them build them. They had the original idea. They had the majority of the stock. So all of a sudden now they're supposed to be making public policy for the rest of us. Who elected them? What constraints are on them? You know, if you follow the chain of the gate, Gates uh, Foundation, they got, they give money to everybody and money talks and BS walks. You can buy court cases, you can buy politicians, you can buy legislation. And so we have a situation here where obviously, um, you know, you getting on a trip and going to, you know, Europe for vacation to see something that, you know, create a lifetime memory for your week or 10 days going through three European countries cannot be, a we have to tax that because that's pollution. You know, airplanes create a lot of emissions, but uh, if, if 400 people, 300 people are packed into a 787 Dreamliner. We're going to have to put a tax on that because the Untermenschen are creating all this pollution. But uh, we're going to exempt private jets because uh, when I'm a master of the universe and I have to fly to Davos to meet with the other masters of the universe so we can conspire about how we're going to get more power and wealth, that doesn't need to be taxed. The hypocrisy, it drips with hypocrisy. And I don't like hypocritical people and talk. You, you, you know, if, if Bill Gates said, I believe that the earth's being destroyed by human beings and all, we have to do this, this, and this, and I'm going to cut, I'm going to set going, you know, sackcloth and, you know, put ashes on my head and, you know, living as an example. Well, no one would care by the way, but at least you could say the guy's not a hypocrite, but these people actually believe, I think, I don't know any of these people, obviously, I've never talked to them. I'm not a psychiatrist. But I think when you have $100 billion, you think that you're, you think you're smart. And you think you have all the answers. And you have the means then because you have that kind of wealth that you can make things happen. No one with a sign with a piece of cardboard stapled to a stick marching around in front of the UN that you have no power. No one cares. No one listens to you. You are what's known as a fart in a mitten. You're not, it, you just dissipate. As soon as you're gone, no one cares you were there. But if you have $100 billion and you create a foundation and you can drop money in the sock of various politicians, if you can influence legislation, if you can influence governments, which they can with that kind of wealth, then you, know, you think you have real power. But who, where's the checks and balances on this power? Is it for good or bad? Who, the only person that determines whether their actions are good or bad are them. They're not subject to any kind of uh, legislation or democratic review or whatever. So what are the constraints? There are none. And so as I've said before, I do believe that people of wealth and power conspire with each other to get more wealth and power. And unfortunately, I believe that men are fallen in a fallen world. And I believe that many of their uh, activities end up being nefarious. That's just what I believe. So this is a manifestation, uh, you know, um, Taxes on jet fuel only for the untermenschen, for the little people. 
for the useless eaters. Not for me, because I'm a master of the universe and I have to go here and talk with the other masters because we're going to we're going to control everything. So these people say these things, and this is, you know, okay, great. Ted Turner said, so who's Ted Turner? He's a guy that created CNN. He's a billionaire. He owns, he's one of the largest landowners in the U.S. And here's what he said, a total population of 250 to 300 million people, a 95% decline from present levels would be ideal. So if he said that, which I'm assuming he did, he's made other comments like this, what's the follow-up question? So I have a question, Mr. Turner. You think that would be ideal? In what time frame would you want to achieve that? And they force him to answer the question. 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years? If it's in 10 years, how do you plan on achieving a 95% reduction in the population that you consider ideal? You never hear these follow-up questions. I mean, if they're asked, we don't know what the answers are. And it wouldn't really matter if you asked me that, you know, if somebody, if I was a, a nitwit that uh, believed this and you said, well, John, uh, a total population of 20, 250 to 300 million people would be, you know, you said that that would be ideal. How would you achieve that? Well, I, you know, believe that we should maybe introduce a, uh, you know, virus or something to control the population. We should sterilize people and people would think I was crazy, but no one would listen to me because I don't have any power or money. This, this guy's a nitwit. He's a kook. What's this guy's plan? What, what time frame does he want to do this over? Are anybody in his lineage or in his family going to be subjected to any of these control measures? We don't know. It's never asked. And that would give us a very interesting view into their psyche of what they're really doing. Does he meet with other people of power and wealth to try to make these things happen if they actually believe them? Because he thinks it's ideal. Does Bill Gates think it's ideal? Do the Rockefellers think it's ideal? Does Soros think it's ideal? Do the other people that we don't even know about that have wealth and power that don't put themselves out into the, uh, the public uh, uh, stage, do they think it's ideal? What are they planning to do? Because they have means to do it. They can influence politicians. They can create, they have, I'm not talking about having a couple million dollars. You're still a fart in the wind. When you have billions of dollars, you have power. Who's checking them? What are they trying to do? What constraints are they, are they subject to? Who's reviewing what they're doing? And who put them in charge? So this is another thing. This is uh, David Rockefeller. I mean, I'm sure John D., the guy that created Standard Oil, all these near-do-wells and hanger-ons, the guy won the genetic lottery. He's in the lineage of John D. Rockefeller who created Standard Oil, put it in everything in a trust. And these people that have come after him, instead of trying to create more energy or create better a better world, they're doing everything they can to uh, undermine it with all these wacky weirdo uh, tip uh, type, uh, you know, policy. So here's what he says. The negative impact of population growth on all our planetary ecosystems is becoming appalling, appallingly evident. I mean, why do these guys always look like ghouls or some type of um, bad guy in a, in a Hollywood movie? You know, look at this guy. I mean, he looks like the Crypt Keeper, you know, and what is he doing about it? Is he, who's he meeting with? What's he using his wealth from that foundation that John D created, you know, one of the most explosion of wealth and prosperity based on uh, the refining process of petroleum products, um, and this guy's a descendant because he happened to be born in, with that last name. Now he's running around doing what? You know? So if he believes that population growth is a planetary, uh, is, a, is, a, is a negative impact, he has the means to try to do something about it. What is he trying to do? Does anybody care? And so what, what's said is, well, John, you're a conspiracy theorist. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. People of wealth and power, they say these things. What are the follow-up questions? Well, what exactly are you using your wealth to do about it, Mr. Rockefeller? If you think there's too much people, Ted Turner said we should reduce the population by 95% in the next, you know, 25 years or whatever the answer would be. Do you agree with that? How do you, how do, should we achieve that, sir? You see what I'm saying? Are you getting the point? It's not a conspiracy. People of wealth and power conspire to get more wealth and power, and they think that they have the answers. And what, what is your input into it? None. you got to go along with it. 
So this is interesting this week, getting on to the investment portions of this financial. So let's just talk about this real quick, junk bonds, right? Junk bonds are issued by companies that have low credit ratings below investment grade. That means they're at risk of going bankrupt or not making their payments. So what did we find out this week? Investors headlong embrace of risk passed a new milestone in recent sessions. The return that investors receive for investing in the riskiest U.S. companies fell below inflation. A rally in the corporate debt rated below investment grade has pushed yields to record lows around 4.57%, while consumer prices rose 5% in May compared with a year earlier. That marks the first time in history junk bond yields have dropped below the rate of inflation. The move upends the conventional logic of investing in bonds, which are typically prized for protecting investors' money. Junk rated companies include those most likely to miss interest payments or go bankrupt. Buying bonds that yield less than inflation means locking in a loss. So we've talked about this before. If the inflation rate is higher than the rate of return you have of the bond, you have a real negative yield. That means you are losing purchasing power. And that's in a US treasury bond, which is, which is considered to be almost risk-free. Okay. And now you're talking about junk bonds selling below the rate of inflation. So you're taking a negative return on a, on a, an asset that is so risky that the company may go bankrupt or is, may not be able to pay its interest payments. Do you see how much, how skewed everything is now by the federal reserve and these other central banks creating all this liquidity? It has nowhere to go. So it's pushing down the yields of these bonds that are below investment grade. We are in a historic bubble. I don't know when it pops. When it does, it's going to create turmoil like you won't believe. I can't even envision what the repercussions are going to be. But this is not good. This is just amazing. And we've seen it just about in every asset class. I've talked about this ad nauseum. Okay, U.S. coal exports are booming. This is tremendous. Um, everybody said coal was dead. You see what's happening here. These are just exports. It's happening all over the world. Natural gas is in shorter supply where they can do fuel switching they are. As economies recover, the demand for energy, you cannot have economic growth without energy growth. It's that simple. And that's what a lot of these masters of the universe want to stop. They want to stop energy growth. They want to stop, stop economic growth. Why would they care if the economy grows, if your business grows, or if you can supply, uh, you know, create wealth for your family because they have a hundred billion dollars. What do they care? That's your problem. So here's what you have happening. Um, this is good for, for us, uh, obviously for the coal stocks that we own, they've been tremendous performers, specifically one of them, which I'm not going to get into because it's for subscribers only. But if you're on Twitter curating a good uh, bunch of people, you already know what one of the best performing Twitter coal stocks is. So I expect we're going to see tremendous earnings over the next couple quarters because prices are up at like 10 year highs. The news is just getting better and better for coal. So this is uh, what I consider another positive sign for oil. Um, you know, Calgary is in Alberta. Alberta is one of the most prolific oil provinces, states, if you will, in North America. And so because of that, Calgary is known as a you know petroleum type city, right? It's a big city. It has a lot of companies based there that are in the oil and gas business. So it makes sense that the University of Calgary would have would have had a uh, oil and gas engineering program, a petroleum engineering program. So here's the recent news: the University of Calgary has suspended admission for its oil and gas engineering bachelor program amidst a downturn in Canada's energy sector and a transition towards a more renewable future. Hmm. In fact, enrollment for the program has hit an all-time low with only about 10 students registered over the course of the last two years. Quote, through the conference, what we saw was a lot of anxiety, kind of being associated with the idea of going back into oil and gas or being pigeonholed into one career, especially in an industry that had kind of a precarious future. So this is the kind of things you see by first level thinkers right at round inflection points. So we've had, you know, a tremendous bear market, a tremendous depression in the oil and gas industry over the last five or plus years. 
And so no one obviously is going into petroleum engineering because why would you? It's going away, right? That's what the masters of the universe say. That's what the guidance counselor in high school told me. You need to go into renewables. So you're living in Edmonton or Calgary and you're coming out of high school. You live in, in the middle of the Western Canadian sedimentary basin, one of the most prolific oil and gas regions in the world. You have the oil sands at Fort McMurray up there, okay, that have 30, 40 years of reserves. And you're going, <laughs> you, you are in, in a situation where you're in the winter up there and the temperatures are below zero. And you think it's a more renewable future. Who's telling these kids this? What renewables? You're going to, you, how are you going to, I, I'm curious, does anybody at the University of Calgary, can they explain to me, if, you, if you're from the University of Calgary, if you're in the engineering department there, you can contact me and I'd like to have a conversation with you about how the city of Calgary is going to get through January, December, January, and February with renewables, with a renew, more renewable future. Those cities only exist because of oil and gas. Oil and gas goes away, they go away. The University of Calgary goes away. I just don't get it. But this tells me it's not another inflection point because these are all first level thinkers like Gordon Brown when he sold the UK's gold at the absolute bottom in the late 90s. Like when we see these magazine covers, they always get it wrong because they're all first level thinkers. They are just looking at the current uh, news and trend, current news and thinking, extrapolating that into the future. And they don't understand these things are cyclical type situations and you just can't get away from it. At the current time, there's no viable alternative to oil and gas for many, many products and services that we take. Civilization itself is based on oil and gas. The growth that we've had in the West over the last 50 years is based on oil and gas and cheap energy. It's that simple. So I suspect that in three to five years, if they're gonna get rid of this program, they'll be talking about bringing it back in five years. Because I think, as I said before, we're going to have a, we've had so much underinvestment in oil and gas, it's not going away. Um, and I think that there'll be a demand for people in this industry because the people that are in the industry right now are old, excuse me. I had to take a drink of coffee. Um, and they're gonna retire and they're not being replaced, but yet the demand for those people will be there. Or maybe they'll be supplied by Russian universities or Chinese universities, I don't know. Never say never. So we'll see, uh, but I think this is a positive because it shows that uh, there's no interest in oil and gas, but yet the price is you know, breaking out and we're having these massive drawdowns. So we'll see. So I've talked about this before and this particular individual, take note of the um, Twitter handle. I would follow this person on Twitter. Very good information that they put out. It's one of the people I follow. But I've talked about this before. The ETF creation and deletions as a contrary sign. And he did a, or I don't say he, this person, I don't know if it's a he or she, did a um, tweet couple of tweets about this. And I thought I just wanted to bring it to your attention because it fits in with the magazine cover and the, the stupidity of the University of Calgary getting rid of their oil and gas program, being in an oil and gas province, right at the you know inflection point of the market. So what happens here says, as far as contrary indicators go, few are as powerful as ETF launches and delistings in cyclical industries. That is correct. It's one of the tools I use. And he gives an example, coal, which was the coal ETF peaked a few months after its launch in 2008. So what happened was in 2008, we were in the middle of a commodity resource bull market. All resources were making highs. And so what do the uh, pointy shoes and uh, chiselers on Wall Street do? We took, we, we've talked about this before. They want to get assets under management. Hey, coal is hot. Let's create an ETF. So what do they do? They do the paper, requisite paperwork. They put out a marketing campaign. It's at the top of the market. Everybody's interested. Money pours in. Assets under management. It's a cyclical business. It goes into the tank right after that because they brought the thing out at the top of the market. That's what they do. That's why it's a contrary indicator. That would have been the time to sell. And then for the next 10 years, the thing was in a doghouse. And it just bled assets out. Nobody was investing in it. So 
it just didn't become viable or worth the effort to continue having the ETF. So they got rid of it in 2020. Lo and behold, what's the performance of a basket of coal stocks since two th- it was since the ETF was deleted in December 2020? Well, you can see from this chart that he put up, he named I think five or six, five different uh, the major coal companies up here to the right. And the return since the delisting is 115% to the positive. So that is the power of using this type of indicator. Um, these guys always get it wrong at the inflection points. Um, it's just the nature. The, the market runs on sediment and liquidity. And when the sediment is high, when everybody's in, that's when they, you know, Kathy Woods is a perfect example, an arc. You know, she could do no wrong. She was drawing in all these assets, you know, and then when this, you know, when the thing, when the market turned against her recently from growth to value, now it's kind of switching back a little bit, but I mean, assets were pouring out. We get these in financial history, you can go back and just look at time after time in different periods where these people do the same thing and something gets hot. It's the new shiny object, all the, all the, all the assets chase it. We've talked about this before. They have the same in Canada in the junior resource market. When the ducks quack, feed them. When an industry becomes hot, uh, they will create all these products to get get your money. And cre- regardless if you make money, they could care less. So this is just a you know a great contrary indicator. It's not the only one we use. It's just another in our arsenal of other contrary indicators. So. I want to talk about the volatility in resource markets, specifically uranium right now, but it applies to all the other resource markets. And this is another person you should follow, Cycle Bottom. They're outstanding. Most of their posts are really great. And what this person did was show a stock that they, that they I guess, dealt with in the previous bull market. It's a Forsyth Metals. This is the performance during the last bull market. I think it topped out at close to 10 bucks a share was under a dollar when this uh, bull market started. But what I think is important is, is we're in the middle of a down period now. It's all, it was all unicorns, rainbows, puppy dogs, and little kids and lollipops recently in the uranium market. And I would suggest to you that a lot of the uranium stocks, particularly the juniors, got ahead of themselves um, for different reasons. Now, I'm a long-term bull on uranium. Nothing's changed in my thesis. I got in well before anybody was talking, hardly anybody was talking on Twitter, okay? Um, Now everybody's talking about it and a lot of money has come in. So what I wanted to point out to you is what happened with this particular stock and it's indicative of what happens to a lot of resource stocks in these bull markets. And I think you're gonna find it interesting and instructive and you really need to think about this. So volatility, make it your friend. So in 2005, whoops, 2005, the stock went from 90 cents to 30, okay? So it had a basically two thirds decline, 66% decline. And then it rallied and went to $1.70 and then dropped to 70. So in the space of 12 months, you had two 50% declines in this stock would you have held? What would you have done with that kind of volatility? Would you have sold? Remember, Amazon had two or three 90% drops on its way to the wealth it created. So what would you have done? What will you do now in the midst of this uh, uranium pullback? Would you have traded it? So you would have got in it, you would have got back in at 30 cents, you would have sold at 90 and got in at 30? You would have wrote it all the way up to $1.70 and then sold it and got back in at 70. Interesting. If you can, if you actually did those trades and can time things like that, I need to bar and you can do that consistently, like well above 50%, because I will give you all my money to manage because no one can do it. 2006, we had a drawdown. Okay. This is on the way now. Remember, this is on the way. This is over a three three and a half, four year period where we went from under a dollar to $10 a share. This is where the real wealth was created in the last year. But this is what happened in the interim. In 2006, you know, we had a high of 290. Remember the previous low the previous year was 30 cents. 
But in 2006, we had an, another more than 50% drawdown in the stock. The volatility was there. What would you have done? Would you have had the conviction to hold it? Would you have had the conviction to buy more at $1.10 and add to your holdings? What would have been your thought process? What would have been your emotional status? Again, 2007, before we made the final blow off top, we had a drawdown from 880. What if you bought back here, even at $1.70, you got to 880 and it dropped to seven or 690. You say, that's it, I'm out. This is what I'm trying to tell you. The big money is made in these big moves, okay? But there's a tremendous amount of volatility on the way. And so we're gonna see that in this uranium market. You know, the stocks are ahead of themselves, especially the juniors. There's a lot of positive news out there. The ultimate long-term fundamentals have not changed. They've gotten a lot better, but that doesn't mean the stocks are just gonna go continuously higher. People get bored. People, other shiny objects appear to attract their attention. Uh, the general market itself has an effect, you know, uranium stocks and resource stocks are stocks. If the overall stock market goes down 30%, resource stocks are going to go down 50 or 60%. That's just how it is. It has nothing to do with the ultimate fundamentals of a cyclical market that's in a long-term bull market. And so what I'm telling you is, is that to get through these periods of volatility, to understand them, you have to have conviction. That means you have to have done the work. You have to have formulated a thesis. Then you have to ask yourself, this thing just had a 50% drawdown, but I can't see anything in this industry to cause that. You know, as Buffett says, in the short term, the market is a weighing machine in the long time, or excuse me, in the short term, it's a voting machine. In the long term, it's a weighing machine. So we have a view that there's going to be growth of nuclear is here. Plants are being built, but mines aren't. And that's gonna be a problem in the future. So if a stock changes value, over 30 or 40 or 50% over a period of six months, that shouldn't affect our view long-term. But I can tell you for most people, it will. And that's why most people don't make these gains. They don't get multi-baggers because they don't understand, they don't have the conviction because they have not done the work. You know, you cannot just, you know, you could try to trade around these things. Um, some people try to do it. I don't do that. I buy way back here before anybody's even talking about it because I've created my thesis back here and I just ride it, okay? And then I look for indicators, which we've mentioned many times when I think that we're getting in a frothy market. And, but we're nowhere near where this thing's gonna top out currently, but we're gonna have drawdowns. You're gonna have drawdowns in your stock. And my, my view is you, in a bull market, in a long-term secular bull market in something, a cyclical bull market, or bull market in a cyclical industry, sorry, you buy the dips and you hold and you, it's like, you know, riding up. But the reason I'm able to hold is not because I'm obstinate or because my ego, it's because I've done the work and I understand where this thing's ultimately going. And so I can look past the current storm. Okay. It's like crossing an ocean. We're going to go through storms, but I look at the ultimate prize, discovering the new land, the promised land, you know, life changing wealth. Now, eventually these things do go into bear markets because the supply dynamic, demand dynamics, the markets change. But this is very important. What you need to think about what you would have done. How would you have thought about this? If this happens now, will you be able to ride through it? Will you try to trade around it? When will you get back in? If you just you know, saw something drop two thirds, would you say, well, this is over with because I've seen things on Twitter just in the recent pullback. People that really don't know what they're talking about. Well, this thing's over. I don't see the I don't see the bull market here. I don't see the thesis. That's because they don't haven't done the work. They just look at the price action, the volatility. As Rick Rule says, who's a billionaire, it's not just because of this of this statement, but it's part of the reason. Make in these resource markets, you have to you have to understand cyclicality, and you have to make volatility your friend. This is a very important piece of information I'm giving you in these two slides. If you're going to be in these markets, very important. Okay. This is another thing that I think I want to reiterate to people. This is the holding period of stocks and years by individual investors. Um, you'll see back in the 50s, 60s, even in the 70s, the average holding period 
for a stock was five, six, seven years. Now we're down to less than a year. If you're going to be somebody that's going to try to invest in large cap stocks like Apple or Walmart, you have no advantage. You might as well just buy a, a um, low cost S&P fund from Vanguard and have pay the cheapest fees and just buy the S&P. That's a viable strategy. I don't recommend it at these valuations, but you have no advantage. You are not going to sit in your house and look at Apple or Walmart financial statements and reports uh, from the company and have an edge over Wall Street. They know, I mean, they fly drones over the Walmart parking lot and Target parking lot to try to get an edge about traffic patterns in the store, okay? They have PhDs on staff. They have computing power that you can only, you can't get near. They have unlimited time to talk and, and discuss these things and mull them. So one of your biggest advantages or your edge, okay, is patience. You have the ability to do two things that give you an edge over Wall Street and give you an edge over these big fund managers. Number one, you can buy large positions in very small companies. They cannot do it. They have the law of large numbers comes into play. They are unable to take relevant positions in some of these smaller companies. It just, you know, if they try to put a hundred million dollars into some company that has a $200 million market, they can't do it. And if they put, you know, 10 million, it's not going to move the needle for them. So they don't bother. So that's advantage. Number one, your other advantage is patience, patience. I have a long, I have a cyclical bull market in a cyclical, I have a bull market in a cyclical industry. Do I have the patience to stick around and let this thing play out for me? That's your advantage. And if you're selling your own holding periods only a year, how are you going to, how are you going to get this? You're going to catch it right here and write it here. Right. Like I said, if you can do that consistently well over 50% of the time, let me know who you are and I will get all the money I can and put it in your charge. If you can show me that track record, I don't buy it. Nobody's that good. You'll hear of stories where people do that here and there, but they can't do it consistently. It's impossible. So your advantage is being patient, getting on a, a, a sea change, a transition, a phase change, and then sitting there and letting it play out over time, several years. And that's when you get the big payoff. And if you will not be patient, if you're constantly trading in and out because you want that dopamine hit, you want that action, you want to gamble, uh, you're bored, um, nothing's happening, so you're going to make something happening by trading in and out, um, you're not going to be successful. I'm not saying you won't, but your chances will be very, very low. There are, I shouldn't say there's nobody that can do it. People do do it, but you know, people walk on tight ropes in the circus too. Most people can't do it. I mean, it's just... Most people can't play hit major league pitching. Some people can do it. Some people can trade consistently, okay? You're not gonna do that. Your best bet is to find either compounding companies and hold them through all the ups and downs or find cyclical markets, catch the inflection point and hold on till it inflects at the top. That's it. And this is a tremendous advantage. The big boys can't get into your pool. So if you become good at it, if you can become understand, you can understand it and you can find the companies and then you can actually execute and, and sit there and be patient, you can make tremendous amounts of wealth. This is how you get the multi-baggers. And if you can do it in size, you can make life-changing wealth. That's how it's done. So, you know, we talk about renewable energy we kind of ignore hydropower. Hydropower is actually a big component of renewable energy that they don't talk about. And so I found this interesting that, you know, because of the drought out West, the amount of water that's behind some of these dams is shrinking. And so it's going to be causing a problem if the levels continue to go down. So what's the article say? So as that water level lowers, we have less pressure pushing down on our turbines. So each turbine can make less power. So that's the impact talking about the water behind the dam. And this is the guy that's the area manager for the Lower Colorado Dams Office, which oversees the Hoover, Parker, and Davis Dams. Hoover Dam has the capacity to generate enough power to serve about 1.3 million people. That's when the lake is fuller. Okay, well, my question is, is what's filling in for the, the discrepancy now? 
the demand is still there for those 1.3 million people, but where's the power? What's the plan? But the drought descended and recently the lake is dropping a foot a week. That's not unusual during the summer as water managers deliver water for farms downstream. So the water level goes down. What if it doesn't get replaced? What if we're in a secular drought that lasts a couple decades? You know, where are you going to get the power? So that's another example where people thought, well, you know, even dams are not base load power. It goes back to my entire argument around having a focus on a long-term nuclear renaissance in this country. You know, when somebody's building like a solar project, they talk about the economic impact. Oh, wow. Well, we know from a previous video I did that most of the components are made in China, so we're not getting an economic benefit from that. When you go out there um, to build it, the construction takes a year or less. So what's the construction impact? And it's not high skilled work. It's low skilled work with a lot of people making, you know, not big money, transient type people, lower educated people. And then you have, you know, a few guys dusting the panels off every once in a while and the operation staff. Instead, why don't we focus on nuclear? where we have 300, we have 1,000, 2,000 guys working on the plant, high skilled construction jobs for several years. The engineering, high tech math engineering that goes into it, the parts and components that we, if we mandated they be built here, creating that supply chain of precision parts, metallurgical industries, metal stamping, metal turning, engineering, uh, and plus the operating staff of high, highly trained engineers and technicians for a plant that could be there for a hundred years. Think of the economic benefits of that vice, some of these other things we're doing. And that's my argument. And I think we should do that. If you, if you are of the view that CO2 is the most critical issue of this, of our future, then you have to be an advocate for nuclear power. In my mind, I don't see how you cannot be. And look at all of the ancillary benefits and trickle down benefits you would get from the high tech industry like that, that would have staying power. I mean, we already get 20% of our power from nuclear power in this country. Why don't we expand it to 30 or 40%? It would be tremendous, the benefits for this country. Because even dams, which were the original renewable power, actually have their flaws too. If you don't have enough water, head pressure above the turbines, your production goes down. So last slide I wanted to talk about, this is the, uh, you know, sometimes you got to look at these things visually. And I talk about selling overvaluation and buying undervaluation. And I want to ask you a question. Since 2009 to the present, this is the United States um, basically price index, MSCI share price index for the U.S. This is in red is emerging markets. This is Japan. This is the uh, European Monetary Union, basically Europe. And this is the U.K. So you can see the fourfold or so outperformance of the United States. For the, I want to ask you a question. If I gave you a million dollars and you had two choices, you could invest and you had to make one choice and you had to stick with it for 10 years. With looking at this, would you put the million dollars in the US or would you put it in emerging markets? Or, I mean, forget the rest of these. Your choices are emerging markets for the next 10 years or the US. Where do you think you're going to be in 10 years? Do you think that this is going to close this gap or do you think it's going to get bigger or do you think this is going to outperform this? I, my choice would be I would take the emerging markets because these things, this is not going to continue like this. We go through these cycles of overvaluation and undervaluation. And I would suggest to you that we are getting close to the end of this crazy bull market we're in. We have to be. It's the, the overvaluation metrics. Now, it's not to say it can't continue because anything's possible. But oh, if you had to buy something and hold it for 10 years, <clears throat> would you want to be long this or long this? Where's the mean reversion going to happen? It's just a question. Uh, so... I think it's something to consider. And when you put in these visual terms, it kind of really brings it home. It's like, okay, that's really crazy looking. <laughs> and a lot of people have benefited from this, this financialization and this money printing and the sediment that we've had over the last 10 years since the 2008 
you know, recover, so-called recovery. You can see what happened. This is the COVID drop, you know, and like I've said before, money, print, um, sediment and liquidity drives markets. And we've had a tremendous amount of liquidity. And I don't know if it's going to continue for the next 10 years. All right, guys, that's it for this week. Appreciate the uh, following. Appreciate the uh, support. Appreciate the viewership. Um, you guys make it happen. And uh, again, thank you for that. All right, that's it. We'll talk to you next week.